Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, if you, any of you are on the panel on Tuesday, I thank you for coming back. And if any of you are new, I hope that you get uh, a lot of resources out of this panel on coping and balancing with stress and uncertainty given the circumstances that we've all been in since March. Um, so I just want to start off by talking about stress. And if any of you were in this panel the other day, you know that stress is really fear about the future. Um, what some people might not know is that stress is experienced in mental, physical, and social ways. And it's any time we go through any sort of change. And the change could be really small or minor. And if I, I can give you the example of, let's say you're sitting in a room, and all of a sudden the room becomes freezing cold. You might have that physical response of shivering or getting goosebumps, but you also might have the mental thought of, well, this is kind of annoying. And you might turn and say to your friend, isn't this kind of annoying that it's very cold right now? All three uh, forms of health, mental, social, and physical, are being represented by responding to this stress. Now, granted, even though it is small scale, it still requires your body to go through a variety of different changes and adaptations in order to deal with it. What this presentation today is going to be about is how to counter some of those feelings if they become uncomfortable and how to deal with them going forward. So I always like to bring in this diagram of how stress can be represented both in the body, the mind, behaviors, and emotions. Now, I know for myself, when I get really stressed, my shoulders really tense up, I tend to get a headache, and my mind is going a million different directions um, in a, a minute. So um, those are some ways I know I feel stressed. Um, I don't know about you three, what do you uh, feel about when you get stressed? I definitely get headaches as well, and I'll feel like my face turn red, I'll feel it getting hot, I might get a little fatigued, feel like I have to lay down, so I definitely can see how mm -hmm. they all play into one. I think for me, often I, um, I can't sleep at night, and then I'm up late, and then I'm really tired the next day, so I know that usually when I can't fall asleep at night, and I'm tired the next day, that I, some, something is stressing me out at that point. It's a good indicator. And similar to Ms. Cooney, when I'm really stressed, I have a lot of trouble sleeping. And then I feel like just kind of frazzled and getting through what would be a routine day is sometimes just more difficult. Right. And even though these emotions and these feelings are uncomfortable, they actually come from somewhat of a good place. So let me explain. Stress actually was back when we were simpler people, when we had to hunt and gather our food, we, it was a method of survival because if we saw something physically threatening, like an animal, an environmental factor, whatever it may be, where we physically needed to run away from it or fight back with it, that was our body's response to stress. It was like, okay, now we have to physically act and move and do something about this. Now, even if the stress is something emotional or mental, such as a friend not answering your text message or a friend ignoring you or failing a test, your body's still gonna have those physical responses to stress. And that doesn't really help us out so much when we deal with stress, it stresses in 2020. We're not fighting off tigers, we're not fighting off an avalanche, um, but we are dealing with stress the same way with those physical responses. So let's talk about, um, as a health PE teacher, I'm going to suggest using your body to counter those physical reactions to stress. Um, so definitely getting moving. So I'm sure once quarantine started, a lot of you were thinking maybe, I really don't know what else to do besides get outside and go for a walk. I know my family and I, we became big on going for walks with and without the dog. Um, but even something as simple as going for a walk is one way to really balance out your stress. You're using all that energy that your body just gave you to fight off whatever you, uh, your body thinks is threatening you, even if it's that big math test on Friday. Um, it's using that energy in a constructive way to get it out of your system. Now, you don't have to be a crazy athlete to do anything that to get stress out of your body physically. You can dance. You can run. It doesn't matter how fast or how slow you're going. Um, if you like a sport, maybe just playing that sport. Um, walking, like I said, with or without your dog, because I know they'll enjoy it. Uh, yoga, so yoga or stretching if, if you're into that. Bike riding, uh, lifting weights, swimming. And you know what? I'm sure there's a bunch that I'm missing. Um, I'm always looking for new ideas. If any of you want to write um, in the chat box anything you found that you uh, have done physically that really helped you out uh, as far as dealing with stress, I would love to hear it. But the reason why all these ways are good ways to relieve stress is because your body needs to move, especially when it's feeling those heightened emotions of stress. So right after you're starting to feel stressed, you're starting to feel, um, okay, I need to move, my muscles are tense, I need to do something, 
And you'd go through it. Maybe while you're doing it, you're thinking, oh, this is kind of annoying. I'm getting a little hot. I'm getting a little sweaty. But afterwards, you'll tend to notice, hey, I feel pretty good. That's because the brain was like, this is a good idea. Let's do this again. And it sends out these chemicals. They're called feel-good chemicals that are called endorphins, um, saying to you, hey, this is a good thing to do. Let's do it again. And it'll calm you down. Because think about it. When you're exercising, your heart's beating faster. You're breathing a little faster because you're doing a movement for a long period of time. The body has to calm itself down after that um, in order to bring you back down to normal. And that, motion, that event of calming you down calms you down physically and emotionally, which could calm you down socially as well. Now, studies have been shown that when you exercise regularly over a long period of time, your sleep improves. You're, if you do have depression or anxiety or if you're having symptoms of depression and anxiety, those symptoms aren't as severe. Uh, not to say that it goes away completely, but it definitely uh, lessens the severity of those symptoms. Um, your posture will be better. You will just be overall feeling a lot better, even if it's something as simple as walking for 30 minutes a day. It doesn't have to be crazy. Whatever you enjoy and you think you're going to stick with is what's going to be best for you. So some of you may be thinking, well, I don't really know if I can keep that up or how am I supposed to know if this is enough? And I'm like, I feel like I'm a very like organized person. I need to see things laid out. So if you look on this example here, I gave a little mock example of a wellness log. Um, so what you can do is you can write down the date you did something physical to maybe when you're feeling stressed. Um, you can write down what you did, how long you did it, and how you felt after. Now, something I might find that would, uh, could help you out, usually helps me out, is I'll usually tell a friend, tell a family member, or a coworker that I'm going to have this plan because usually it helps me out to have someone say, hey, did you do your 10 minute walk today? Did you do your 15 minutes of yoga? And I'll be like, oh no, I did it. So I have to do that. And it keeps you accountable by telling someone about it. And you know what? That actually enhances your social health by maybe doing that together with somebody. So just something if you need to get started and need to get in the habit of it, a wellness log is a great way to get into the habit of using your body and just writing it down and making sure you're taking time for yourself. Because as I said, in different, as it was written in a different slide, exercise is meditation in motion. It doesn't have to be crazy. Anything you enjoy and gets your heart rate up. All right, so Miss Apati had talked about um, how stress can impact someone physically, mentally, and emotionally. So I'm going to speak a little bit about tools to use to focus on your emotions. And then we're going to move into some practices that focus on your breath. And by focusing on your breath, you will be able to then focus on your emotions. Uh, so the first tool we're going to talk about here is challenging thoughts. So when we're stressed, our mind tends to focus on the past and the future. So we often aren't focused on the present moment. So what's happening right now? So sometimes when we're stressed, we're thinking thoughts of like, what if we don't wind up going back to school? What if, um, you know, my classes are very difficult? What if my friends are not in my lunch period? All of, you know, these thoughts that are coming up. And as these what if thoughts come up, sometimes we could just get into a cycle of just worry. And it can be difficult to pull yourself out of this. So this slide right here is giving you some instructions on uh, what to do if you get into this worry cycle. So first, taking a deep breath is always a good idea. Uh, so start out by that. Um, the next bullet point uh, says validate your emotions. So this means the word validate means to tell yourself that your emotions are okay. They are valid. They are true for you. Um, so if you're feeling sad, it's okay you're feeling sad. Um, sometimes we tend to like judge ourselves and tell ourselves that the way we're feeling is wrong. So you're going to validate your emotion and then you are going to figure out a way to, you know, comfort yourself and inform yourself that it can be handled and that this emotion will pass. So I have examples of statements here that you can say. Um, you know, different statements work uh, for different people, but just some examples. Um, if you're feeling stressed or you're feeling overwhelmed, you could say, I will deal with that if and when it happens. I have tools to get through this. I can focus on the present moment. 
So just all different kinds of statements, just to reassure yourself and bring yourself out of that cycle of worry. All right, so this is another tool and it's an acronym. So hopefully it's easy for you to remember. Um, each of the letters in the acronym stands for something. So the S stands for stop. So you're going to pause what you're doing. So that also means, you know, taking a deep breath again uh, when you're starting this out. And then observing anything that you're thinking, any emotions that are coming up for you, any physical sensations in your body. So bringing those all together and just spending some time just to observe them and really see what's going on. And then proceeding could mean using a tool like I talked about in the previous slide to challenge your thoughts, or it could be using a coping tool um, like some of the meditation practices we're, we're going to talk about in the next few slides. All right. So this is called a grounding technique. So grounding means bringing yourself into the present moment. So as we talked about, when you're stressed, our focus is often on the past or the future. So by bringing yourself into the present moment, you can really focus your mind and emotions into getting yourself through whatever stress you might be experiencing. So this is a great technique because you can really do it anywhere and no one will know you're doing it. So if you're feeling stressed and you're in a crowd of people like in class or in a public place, you could do this. So it just involves using your senses. And you can change it um, with the number of things. Uh, this particular order was just what I chose, but you can really switch it for what you feel works best for you. So you start out with five things that you can hear, and then four things you can see, three things you can touch, two things you can smell, and one thing you can taste. And while you're doing this exercise, you want to really place your focus and try and bring yourself away from the worry and anxiety and really bring yourself into each of these senses. And by doing this, the goal and the hope with this is that you are able to calm your body down a little bit by bringing yourself into the present. All right, so this is a good exercise. And I'm going to walk us through it, and I'm going to have the other um, panelists uh, holding up their hands and demonstrating so that you can see what the exercise will look like. So for this exercise, um, you can use your hand as a visual, or you can also just walk through it in your mind. But the goal of using your hand is so that you, once again, are grounding yourself and really bringing yourself into the present moment all right, so you're going to first stretch out your hand like a star, and you're going to take the pointer finger of your opposite hand, and you're going to be tracing it up and down each of your five fingers on this hand that you have out like a star. So while you're moving the finger, you're going to start at your thumb. And as you're moving it up your thumb, you are going to inhale deeply through your nose. So as you're going up, you're inhaling. And then as you're going down the other side of your finger, you're going to exhale through your mouth. So I'll walk you through and we're gonna go over each hand, or sorry, not each hand, each finger of our hand. And we're going to take five deep breaths. So we're going to start on our thumb. And as you're traveling up your thumb, you're going to inhale through your nose. And then you're going to exhale through your mouth as we get to the other side. And then you're going to do the same on your pointer finger. So inhaling through your nose and then exhaling through your mouth. And the same on your middle finger, inhaling through your nose and exhaling through your mouth. Same on the ring finger. So inhaling deeply through your nose and then exhaling through your mouth. And the same for the pinky. So inhaling through your nose and then exhaling through your mouth. So, and you can do this slower. 
you can do it again um, until you start to feel calmer. Like I said, um, the finger is really just to guide you as you're breathing and to help ground you, but it's really just a, a visual. You don't have to do it. Um, but similar to the other grounding technique, this is something you can also do in class or in a public place and um, you know, no one will know that you're engaging in this type of practice. So it could be a helpful way to calm yourself down. All right, this is another technique um, that I found to be very effective and I know a lot of students have found it to be helpful. So without getting too much into like the science of why um, breathing can impact our emotions, uh, there's two different systems in the body. And one of the systems, the sympathetic nervous system, um, it energizes our body, it allows us to respond to something that might be dangerous and get away and protect ourselves. And then the parasympathetic nervous system calms our body down. And so by calming our body down physically, we might be better able to cope with difficult emotions, with stress and anxiety. So by engaging in a breathing exercise like this, you will be um, engaging your parasympathetic nervous system and hopefully allowing your body to calm down and then allowing your mind to be able to refocus, to navigate whatever difficult emotions are coming up. So this technique is called square breathing. So the square is a helpful visual because all of the steps of this um, exercise are for four seconds and there's four steps. All right. So first we're going to start out the exercise. Um, I'll have the panelists demonstrating it as uh, I read along. And similar to the previous exercises, this is something you can do and no one around you will notice. Um, I've had students use this before exams, like when they're waiting for the teacher to hand out the exam booklets and they're doing this breathing exercise to just help bring some of the anxiety down. So you will start out by inhaling deeply through your nose for four seconds. And once you inhale, then you're going to hold your breath just for four seconds. And then you're going to exhale through your mouth for four seconds. Then you're going to pause before you take another breath just for four seconds. And then you'll repeat this until you start to feel calmer. Um, it can take some focus if you're really feeling anxious and stressed, but just by bringing your focus to your breath, it can help you calm down. All right, so this exercise here is something that can be really helpful if you are having a lot of trouble sleeping or if you are having very bad anxiety. Um, so it brings the focus to your physical body. So on any tension or like tightness we might be feeling, as we mentioned earlier, different signs of stress and um, some of us had shared that we have trouble sleeping or we hold tension in our neck and shoulders. So both of the exercises bring focus to the physical body and can really help you to relax. So I'm going to walk us through a body scan exercise. Um, it's gonna be about like roughly three minutes long or so. Uh, you can take longer if you wanna do one of these exercises by yourself. Um, some people do body scans that are 20 minutes and they really focus on very like small parts of their body. We're going to do just more of a general exercise. Um, so kind of wherever you are, you can try and get into a comfortable position. So if you're sitting in a chair, you want to try and just sit up straight with your feet flat on the floor. If you're laying down, just get comfortable. So you're going to start out by bringing attention to your body. So wherever you are, just bring attention to what you're feeling. 
You can close your eyes if that feels comfortable for you, or you could just leave your eyes open and just gaze ahead. So you're going to notice your body seated in a chair, laying down on a bed or a couch. So just notice what you're feeling. You're going to start out by taking a few deep breaths in through your nose and out through your mouth, and just noticing how your breath feels in your body. So we're going to start with your feet. So start out by noticing the feeling of your feet on the floor or on your bed, wherever you might be. You're going to notice the weight of your feet any pressure you might feel, any tension you might be holding. So just take a few seconds and just try and put all of your focus just on your feet. Then we're going to move up your body, bring your focus to your legs. Again, Notice the weight of your legs, any feeling in them, any tension you might be holding. Make sure you're taking deep breaths throughout all of this. Then we're going to move our focus to the back. So notice the feeling of your back against the chair any tension you might be holding in your upper or lower back. Continue taking deep breaths. Then move your focus to your stomach. Become aware of any tension you might be holding. Let it soften. Notice the movement in your stomach as you breathe in and out. Then move your focus to your hands. Notice if you had your hands clenched or loose. Notice any tension you might be holding. Make sure you're continuing to take deep breaths. Then bring your focus up your arms. Feel them against the chair. Then bring your focus up to your neck. Become aware of any tension you might be holding. Continue taking deep breaths. Then bring your focus to your jaw. Notice any tension you might be holding within your jaw. Continue taking deep breaths. Then notice the whole body presence. What are you feeling? Are you taking deep breaths? All right, when you're ready, you can open your eyes if you have them closed and you can bring yourself back to this webinar. <laughs> Um, and if you'd like, you can take a minute to write in the chat box if you felt that this exercise was helpful, if you have any questions about how to do it, um, or any other ideas. I also spoke about another um, exercise on this slide, and it's called progressive muscle relaxation. So well, we could just go to this, oh, thank you. Um, so this slide, uh, progressive muscle relaxation. So this uh, practice is very similar to the body scan. I'm not going to walk you through it. I'll just give you kind of a, a summary of it. So this exercise, similar to the body scan in that you are focusing on small areas of your body and what you're experiencing in them. 
But with progressive muscle relaxation, you are focusing on the part of your body and you are tensing it up and then relaxing it. So you are actually physically tensing it up and relaxing it. This can be helpful in releasing any tension. So similar to this, you can start with your feet, you can start uh, with your face. And like the, the slide says, you would start by scrunching up your face and then relaxing it. So it seems like it could be kind of like silly or you might feel like you look ridiculous, um, but it can actually be a very helpful way to become aware of where you're holding tension and to release some of it. And as always, it's very important to focus on your breath and make sure you are continuing to take very deep breaths while doing any of these practices. All right, so we'll move on to our last practice. All right, so this is a guided imagery practice. Um, I put some pictures just to give examples of places you might want to go to in our guided imagery practice. I'm going to walk us through a practice that involves going to the ocean, but if you prefer a lake or you prefer your backyard or wherever it might be, you would want to pick somewhere that's relaxing for you. So the purpose of this kind of practice is to take you out of a moment that might be stressful and bring you to a place that you find to be calming and relaxing. And then by focusing on the characteristics of this place, you could hopefully regulate your body and some of your emotions. So I will walk us through. Similar to the previous exercise, you want to get comfortable wherever you are. So if you're seated, feet on the floor, back as straight as you can get, and just be comfortable. You can leave your eyes open, closed, really whatever is most comfortable for you. So you are going to first take a deep breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. Just going to bring awareness to any areas of your body that you're holding tension and just try and release some of that tension. You're going to take another deep breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. So first, you're going to imagine that you are walking on the beach. You are walking along the ocean. So you can hear the waves crashing. You can smell the spray of the ocean as the waves crash along the shore. You can feel the moisture in the air from the water. You can feel the cool breeze coming off of the ocean. You feel the texture of the sand on your feet. So you stop walking and you just watch the waves crashing along the sand and then receding back into the ocean. Just spend a few minutes or a few moments watching the waves. So you're just enjoying standing at the edge of the water and watching the ocean. Continue taking deep breaths in through your nose and out through your mouth. And then when you're ready, you can open up your eyes. And if you'd like to share, if you felt that this exercise was helpful, um, or if you'd like to share what place you would travel to in your guided imagery exercise, uh, you could put that in the chat box. Um, and this is something that could also be very helpful to do if you're having trouble sleeping, um, or if you are you know, feeling anxious before a presentation or a big exam. So just some tools for you to use. And then we're going to move on uh, just to Ms. Kehoe, and she's going to talk about some different uh, tools to utilize. 
Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. Um, a big part of this presentation was us wanting, you know, everyone to walk away with things they can use um, accessible at home or in school, wherever you may be, um, and discreetly. So I did find some apps that I thought would be helpful for students, even if parents may want to use them. Um, it's really for all ages. Um, one of the ones I found is called the SAM app, or Self-Help for Anxiety Management. Um, it offers ways and information to cope with depression, anxiety, and loneliness. Um, I know during this COVID-19 pandemic, being out of the school building, a lot of us were, you know, confined to our homes. Um, we didn't get a lot of that social connection um, other than whoever lived in our home. So this would be a good app to kind of go to, um, you know, depending on what happens in September, we don't know if we're going back in person, hybrid, whatever it may be. This is an app you can always go to um, to look for some uh, methods to cope with anxiety. Um, it's actually developed by students, psychologists, and scientists um, is what I read about it. So you'll find that other students will post in the forums. Um, and something I find is that when others are kind of going through similar emotions as us, and we can see that, it helps us to feel less lonely. So this was one of the apps that is good. Um, I also want to just add, as we go through the apps, before you download anything, add anything to your phone, you may want to check with your parent or guardian, make sure it's okay, let them look through it. I did download all these apps um, on my own and created a profile just to check them out. They all are free to download, but as, you know, any other app, they do offer, you know, premium versions for a price, but it's not necessary. Um, all these apps are accessible for free. Um, so I just wanted to make sure you all knew that. Another app that I found that I really liked, um, and similar to what Ms. Haddock was talking about um, with the challenging negative thoughts, was the Thought Challenger. Um, and it's an app where you can kind of put in your stresses, your negative thoughts, and it helps you um, kind of balance out your mood and see a more positive way uh, to look at a situation. So it kind of helps you from being overly critical of yourself. Um, you know, it gives you different strategies you can use. And it's just a good way, you know, when you kind of need some confidence or self-esteem booster to kind of help turn those negative thoughts around. And then the third is Happify. Um, this one I really liked because it had games and activities um, that you can do that kind of help you overcome thoughts, stress, and helping you cope with emotions. Um, a kind of uh, theme across the board is that distractions can really help you kind of get your mind off of whatever is stressing you out at that time. So I like that there were activities for this, good for teenagers and adults, all ages. This is another app that has a forum that you may see other students post kind of what their worries and stresses are. Um, so I thought this was a really good app for you guys to try and it also has some meditation um, aspects as well. The fourth last example um, that I get to detail with is Mood Path. Um, I like this one because you kind of track your moods over time. You get to journal, it offers information on different anxiety coping skills, depression coping skills, um, offers different tools for encouragement. I did find it to be a great resource for meditation exercises, um, quick ones you can do on the go, right before a test, um, you know, any other stressful event that may be coming up. Something else I did want to mention about these apps is they're a great go-to, um, a quick, you know, help to calm yourself down, but if you are feeling like you need more than, you know, an app or um, anything technological, it's not the same as a human being. So you may still want to talk to your school psychologist or school social worker in the building, um, or you may want to talk to your parent about seeing someone, you know, outside of your home. But that's a conversation you'll have with your parent or guardian. Um, I just wanted you to know that, you know, these apps are great, but they're not the end all be all for mental health. And then I added some other examples. Um, Headspace and Calm are pretty popular. Um, I know there's commercials for them, so many of you may have seen them. I also added a few other ones. You're in Pixels, a student actually showed me um, this past year. You track your mood every day and it actually paints a picture over time, which I thought was really cool. Um, and that's very similar to Mood Flow, which does a similar thing. MindShift, Mood App, and Mood Balance App 
they all have a meditation piece of it, a journaling piece, um, and really focuses on switching that negative mood into a more positive one. So the only way for you guys to see what works for you is to try, try them, look at them. Um, some may work, some may, you may not find as helpful, but if there's anything you guys know of that I haven't already mentioned, or if you've tried any of these apps in the past and you found them helpful, feel free to put that in the chat box um, and share. We'd love to hear it. And then um, I also wanted kind of a, a tangible activity that you can do besides being alone. These are called coping skills on the go. I actually have my example um, right here. Well, these are um, coping card examples. So this is something that Ms. Kehoe uses with her students often. Um, when I use them with sometimes with students too, and you can even use like an index card or a post-it. Uh, you can use them in many different ways. You can put um, different coping strategies. So like some of them here that she has listed. So like make it funny. So making a joke, getting yourself to laugh during a, a stressful situation. Um, as we talked about before, exercising or uh, listening to music, taking a break, um, naming your feelings, so identifying your emotions. You can also put different statements on the cards. So like I talked about earlier, um, different statements to tell yourself when you're experiencing anxiety. So just another idea just of something to use. Uh, you can leave the cards in your wallet. You can put them um, in a binder if you want to bring them to school. Just some different ideas. I also really like the positive self-talk one because oftentimes we talk to ourselves in our minds so much more negatively than we would talk to a friend. Um, if Miss Cooney was thinking, you know, I'm pretty nervous about this presentation, and I said to her, well, you probably won't do a good job. You're probably going to mess it up. That wouldn't be really nice of me to say at all. But oftentimes it is how we talk to ourselves. So changing that narrative to maybe how we talk to someone we really care about, because we should really care about ourselves and build ourselves up. So maybe having a visual of it in your uh, locker, in your uh, binder, as uh, Ms. Haddock was saying, is definitely a good way to remind yourself and keep you grounded. And these and are just a couple more examples. Sorry, go ahead. Yep, no, I was just gonna say that same thing. So just more examples of different coping cards. Lastly, I believe these are um, exercises um, on the cards that you can do. Um, so we have that body scan again. Uh, we have a different type of breathing. Uh, we have echo. So have someone talk to you and be a copycat and say everything that they're saying at the same time as them. Something silly to get you laughing, get you um, out of the thinking of just the thing that's stressing you out. And actually laughing does naturally release those feel-good chemicals, like I talked about earlier, those endorphins, um, and genuinely makes you feel better immediately. And now I believe it's time for Ms. Cooney to talk about some time management skills. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. So glad that you guys joined us today. Um, as we talked a lot about different ways to help alleviate stress, I think that it's really important to um, talk about our time management skills because um, it is important that we are prioritizing our tasks throughout whether um, it be your schoolwork, your home life responsibilities, um, our better time management skills are certainly going to um, help us to be more confident. And that is then going to lead for us to work more effectively. So um, I think that, you know, I can certainly say for myself, we're all guilty of procrastination and that procrastination can kind of lead you to this like overwhelming slippery slope which can then kind of um can impact your grades you know and lead to poor grades when you're procrastinating so if you build upon your time management skills um along the way that can certainly help alleviate some of that stress so as you can see here, um, these are some main points in terms of um, time management. I'm going to go back to prioritizing and organizing in the next slide because I want to go through some important aspects of that. So I'm going to go ahead and jump to uh, creating a schedule and budgeting your time. So first, I think that um, what would be helpful for you is to create a schedule for yourself. So you have 
everyone, we all have 24 hours in a day, right? And we have seven days in a week. So if you um, could actually kind of create a master schedule for yourself where you identify like what you're doing in each hour throughout the day, indicating, you know, what hours you're sleeping, what hours of time you're in school, what hours of time you're at home doing your work. Um, obviously right now, you know, we've been home since March. So uh, that certainly is gonna look a little bit different in terms of like outside of the home hours. So you wanna indicate where are you putting your time in? Um, once you identify where your hours are going, that can help you to um, see where you have that extra time to kind of fill in some of that free time for yourself and that fun time. I always found um, it to be helpful to kind of get creative with that master schedule. I'm more of like, I, I love like seeing something and visualizing something. So I will often color coordinate. So, you know, for me, it's like, okay, these are my work hours and I will put those in red because I work at South. <laughs> and if I'm, you know, sleeping, I might put those in blue. Those are my nighttime hours. And then I'll fill in, you know, coaching time or, you know, friend time, family time, and other things that I enjoy doing, TV time, whatever it may be. Um, so you can certainly get creative in creating that schedule for yourself. So that way you can kind of get an idea of, of where you're putting your time in. Um, once you identify the time, the next thing would be to start working on a to-do list. So, um, you often will always have a planner and agenda that you get. Um, if not, you know, we are obviously in a virtual world right now. So you have your cell phone. So I will often, you know, grab my cell phone and I'll say, okay, you know, Siri, can you put in um, a reminder to do list to do X, Y, Z. So utilize, you know, what tools are going to work for you, um, what you're more inclined to look at. That's really important, too, that you're looking at these um, resources that you're utilizing to remind you to do that, check that to-do list. So that to-do list could be, um, you know, chores that you may have. That could be, um, you know, a test that you have coming up, or maybe you have to watch a sibling, or you have to do laundry, anything um, that you need to do within your day so that you can um, kind of check things off that list. That's my favorite thing is when I can cross something off that to-do list, it's like, yes, like I accomplished that for the day. You know, I, I made it through and I, I did something um, that I that I said that I was going to do. So um, it's kind of like that feel good um, once you check it off, cross it off. So the next thing is um, you want to be able to focus on what it is that you are allotting that time for. So you, in order to focus, it's important that you're eliminating any distractions that you might have. So of course, we all know what our biggest distractions are, and that is going to be our cell phone. So um, if it's your cell phone, if it's social media, if it's um, you know time with your friends, of course, right now in a virtual world, I would say that a lot of this is going to be computer time, maybe video games and whatnot. So if you are setting time aside, especially for schoolwork, um, you certainly want to eliminate those distractions. So maybe um, put on a do not disturb for that time, um, you know, turn it off, mute it, uh, you know, turn it over so that, you know, the notifications on your phone aren't distracting you in that moment in time. Um, and then that way you can focus on what you're doing um, for that time. And especially now while we're home, we have other distractions, right? Maybe you have um, a younger sibling in the household. Maybe there's a baby in the home. Maybe, you know, you have a grandparent staying with you or you have to care for somebody or, you know, there's everyone's doing different things in one house at this moment in time. So just noise distractions alone, um, can be tough to kind of just, you know, turn away from. So um, it, you gotta find that balance for yourself, what's gonna work for you, 
Um, some, some people do work better in maybe, you know, playing some light background music to maybe drown out some of the other talking or conversations that are going on in the house. Um, or maybe you want to share with your family um, what your plans are when you're working on what so that maybe you could put a sign on the door that you know you're not disturbed during that time so it's it's important that um, you know that you're finding that focus time to be able to work on what your tasks are for that moment the next thing is um, you want to find your motivation so I think um, as a counselor and speaking with my students throughout this process, um, this has been an uncertain time that none of us ever expected, none of us ever dealt with. Um, and I think that, you know, there are times where we lose motivation. And I think that, you know, when we lose motivation, it, it, we struggle then to be able to move forward in what our tasks are and what our goals are. So um, this is another, you know, thing that's important for you to identify, like, what are your goals, you know, whether they're short term goals or long term goals, like, it could be a short term goal, like, I want to, um, I want to get through the next chapter of this book before I go to bed tonight, you know, so that you can, you know, work on that um, next assignment. Uh, or it could be long term goals, you know, you really want to be successful in these classes, you want to get good grades, because you want to be able to apply to certain schools or colleges, or you want to um, be able to get through your work so that you can also get a job and maintain all of that um, time and have all of those activities in your schedule. So there's, there's a lot that um, to say about your motivation to help you be successful, especially in this, you know, building this time management schedule for yourself. Um, and like Ms. Abadi said earlier, you know, maybe even just sharing with a friend or a family member and saying, you know, this is my plan. These are the things that I'm going to get done today. This is how I'm going to go about it. This is when I'm doing it. When I'm done with that, you know, we can chat on, you know, Snapchat or text or DM each other, or whatever it may be, watch a movie together. Um, that helps you to be accountable. And, you know, that allows then maybe your family members also to check in with you and your friends to check in like, hey, did you get you know, did you do those math problems or, you know, maybe even it's a classmate and you guys could kind of, you know, work through what you did together after you complete it. So um, that can all <clears throat> certainly help in terms of your motivation moving forward. So another thing is um, taking breaks. So obviously being home, being in front of a computer and um, trying to get through all of this work and find this new normal um it's hard it's very difficult you know and um it's tough to you know sit for a long period of time and you know just work 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 so it's important that um again set those small goals for yourself um traditionally about 30 to 40 minutes of sit time um working on a an assignment and then maybe take a 10 15 minute break uh, you don't want to take too many breaks throughout the day because those breaks eventually kind of, you know, become um, other time that, you know, you end up getting caught in that, those time wasters. Uh, but what you want to do is really set in your schedule. Okay, 30, 40 minutes, I'm going to read um, 20 pages of this and then I will take a break, bathroom break, snack break, water, whatever. Um, maybe go for a walk any of the things that we talked about um, previously during this session would be helpful during those breaks as well. Just to recharge, reset that mind um, so that you can then go on and move on to that next task. And it's good to uh, break up your task. So if you're working on math, you know, maybe I'm not the best math student, I always want to work on the things, um, the assignments that I find the most difficult first. So sometimes like if you want to get those out of the way, so that way you can work your way down um, throughout the day. And that way um, we avoid again that procrastination 
So once you tackle that first, you can check that off and you see how we're kind of, as we go through, you know, we're hitting on all of those other pieces that I talked about previously too. Um, so you don't want to get lost in what you're doing. If you spend too much time, you may not be retaining the information. So it's important to take that step back and recharge. The next part is uh, sleeping. As we've been home, um, I know that a lot of us have probably lost our sense of schedule and routine. Uh, we are definitely going back to a regular, you know, normal school day time, whether we're home or hybrid, whatever we are, or in the building. So I would definitely recommend at this point, um, being the beginning of August, we have about a month left that you start building on that routine again. It will make it a lot easier to get back into the school routine. And you want to have an earlier start to the day because that allows you to have more time to be able to get through your tasks. It's important that you're getting like eight to 10 hours of sleep. You know, we talked about earlier, and I know I said for myself, you know, when I'm stressed, that keeps me up later at night, which then makes me more tired in the morning and it makes it more difficult for me to start my day in the morning at a reasonable hour. So it has that domino effect. So if you are planning everything out for yourself and you're managing your time, that will allow you to kind of complete your different tasks and go through the day and get that, um, that solid hours of sleep. So on the next slide, I have here, um, you have on the top left your urgent matters and important matters. And um, what those are, these are basically while you're prioritizing what you need to complete, you want to think about um, what are the most urgent and important tasks that you need to do. So for example, you have, uh, you know, work, school work deadlines, you have crises, you're cramming for a test or you have to do a last minute preparation for something, for a test or a presentation. Um, those are going to be at that top of that list in terms of prioritizing what you need to complete first. Okay, and then the, um, on the right hand side, you have your not urgent, but also important matters. That would be maybe, you know, reading or taking notes, your personal development we talked about. Um, maybe you're planning to study for something, your health, your exercise, setting your goals. Um, planning your time. That's important because I think a lot of times, um, often I find that students will take so much time planning everything, you know, prioritizing everything, and then that's it. You know, we, we lose time in um, the planning aspect and we have to be sure that we're then executing um, those plans. So those are not necessarily urgent, but it's important that you're doing those. So your priority would be the urgent and important things, and then you would go on to your not so urgent and important matters. And then moving on to the bottom left quadrant, you have your urgent but not as important. And I know as teenagers and, you know, we, the most important things right now are, you know, our friends and social media and DMs and, um, you know, text messages, uh, activities that we have or, anything else, but um, they, they may seem urgent. However, they're not as important, perhaps in other more important things that you can see in the top quadrant. So just be mindful that um, your urgent but not important can often be those distractions that I talked about earlier. And then of course, we have our last quadrant on the bottom right, which is um, our not urgent and not important. Um, and I, I don't want to, I'm not diminishing that, you know, these aren't important things. They're just not important when you're talking about what your goals are for that moment in terms of doing your schoolwork or, you know, being able to meet um, <clears throat> your list of things that you need to do. So some phone calls like watching TV, Instagram, TikToking, um, cell phone, any of those time wasters. So you just want to be mindful about how often these, um, this quadrant is kind of poking into your other um, time. So that way you can start to eliminate those and it's okay, make time for those in your day, but just be sure that when you're prioritizing your time and you're organizing your time, 
the um, the top quadrants are going to be on the top of that list and you're getting those done before you move on to those bottom quadrants. So I always say you don't need to be, um, you know, the smartest student, but if you are an organized student and if you're able to follow some of these um, time management um, tips, I, I, you're going to be a successful student without a doubt, okay? So just remember your organization will lead to your success. And certainly if there's any um, tips that you have in terms of time management that you wanna share in the chat, we'd love to hear from you. And um, from here, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Keo, and she's gonna talk to you about um, how to access more support should you need it. First, I wanna make sure I'm not breaking up. You're good. I'm good? Okay. Um, so sometimes asking for help can be difficult. So we wanted to offer you guys, you know, some tips. First, you know, we want you to know there's nothing wrong with asking for help. Um, think of it as if you were having trouble in your math or English class. You'd go to your parent or guardian, a friend, trusted adult. You'd say, listen, I'm really struggling in this area. I need some extra help. Um, I really need more support. Well, the same can be said about your feelings. Um, sometimes people are having a hard time and they need more support with what they're feeling. Um, when you do talk to someone about what's going on, you wanna say what you're struggling with and how it is affecting you emotionally. So for example, um, coming back from this COVID crisis, you know, whether we're in the building, hybrid, whatever it is, you know, you may say, when I think about going back to school, my heart starts to race and I feel like I'm going to throw up. I'm really nervous to go back that's telling the person, you know, what it is you're struggling with, why it's making you feel the way it's making you feel, um, and letting them know you really need some help in dealing with those feelings. Um, you wanna say, you know, that you do need the help with what you're feeling. And it may just be you need to talk to a friend, a group, um, your parent, guardian, trusted adult, staff member, a school social worker, psychologist, whoever it is, um, you may just need that listening ear. Or you may feel like the support you get from your family and friends is fantastic, it's great, but you think you need more. And you may need more from someone as an outside resource. Um, and I do wanna say that, you know, us as school psychologists, social workers, um, administration, your school buildings do have resources that we can give you um, to families. We've given referrals to families and we're always here to support you no matter what. Um, so always talk about the way you're feeling and don't wait. The sooner you ask for the help, the sooner you're gonna start feeling better. The hardest part for a lot of people is saying you're struggling. You know, we don't like to sound vulnerable, not even to our parents or guardians. Um, but as soon as you get over that hump, that's when the feeling better process begins. And lastly, and importantly, be proud of yourself for bringing it up and saying you need the help. Because like we mentioned, you know, it's, it's hard to do to say you're struggling. So, you know, give yourself a pat on the back for admitting that you're struggling, and then we can get you the support and help you need. Um, so then speaking of resources, I'm gonna turn it over back to Ms. Haddock, and she's just gonna go over a few of these um, easy accessible resources that you can use. So there are lots of resources available. Um, the three on this page are, uh, two of them are crisis resources. So things to utilize when you are really having a difficult time, you're possibly worried for your safety, you need help at that moment. And then one of them is uh, for emotional support. So when we're in school, there are lots of people in the building, uh, whether we're back in school or we're virtual, that can help you. So teachers, administrators, psychologists, social workers, guidance counselors. Um, over the summer, if you're having a very difficult time, you can talk to a trusted adult, um, someone in your family or a friend. And if you uh, really would like to reach out to someone from school, you could reach out to one of the administrators in your building and they could help you find some resources. So two of the resources here, the box all the way to the left is a crisis text line. So you can text hello to that number, 741-741, and someone will text you back and offer support um, in, you know, if you're having a difficult time or you're in an emergency, they can help you. The middle box is for the Long Island Crisis Center. You can text LICC 
to the number listed there. You can also chat them online on their website. And you can see the websites listed right there in that picture. They also have a 24 hour hotline. So you could also call them if you feel comfortable with calling um, to get help. And then on the right side of the screen is the New York State COVID-19 Emotional Support Helpline. So this is a hotline you can call and mental health practitioners within New York State have volunteered to be available for anyone that might call in for emotional support. So they could help you get through a difficult moment or they could also direct you to resources in your community. So these are just some different ways to get help if you need it. All right, so we're just going to take this time. If you have any uh, outstanding questions that we haven't answered, things you're curious about, questions about the resources, uh, write them in the chat box and we will try to answer them as best we can. <laughs> 